Hello, and welcome to the Enter the Bible podcast, where you can get answers or at least reflections on everything you wanted to know about the Bible, but were afraid to ask. I'm Katherine Schifferdecker. And I'm Katie Langston. Uh, and today on the podcast, we're delighted to welcome back uh, our friend and colleague, Rolf Jacobson. Uh, Rolf is a, a professor of Old Testament at Luther Seminary and co-host of uh, some of our podcasts on Working Preacher, right? Am I making that's that up? That's true. That's that's true. So podcasting pro right here, friends. Uh, welcome, Rolf. Thanks for being with Thanks. us today. Thanks. Good to be here. Today, we're uh, continuing uh, round two uh, of our lightning round, uh, and this is when we take questions that come in um, on our website on enterthebible.org, which, listener, if you would like to submit a question, you may do so by going to enterthebible.org, and, and there's a form there that you can fill out. We try to get to all these uh, all these questions, and some of these questions are great questions, but maybe not quite long enough to warrant a full episode in and of themselves. So we try to answer a few of them at a time. And so we have four questions um, to uh, talk about today. And the first one is, who was Cyrus? So that comes in from a listener. Who was Cyrus? Rolf, who was he? Go ahead, Catherine. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> All right. Uh, Cyrus was the... Uh, a uh, warrior, king, emperor, uh, the basically founder of the Persian Empire, who kind of conquered the 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 Near East uh, in the sixth uh, century BCE, uh, uh, including defeating the Babylonian Empire. And Cyrus was also uh, what we might call enlightened, or uh, ran his empire at least differently than. The Babylonians and the Assyrians before him. And so he allowed, so the Assyrians and the Babylonians, who were the two emperors before the Persian Empire in the Near East, um, they had the practice of, of capturing rebellious cities, rebellious peoples, rebellious lands, um, making an, an example of them, destroying their, their cities, and then bringing uh, at least the elite of the land, uh, uh, taking them out of the land and bringing them into exile in Assyria and or Babylon. So that is what happened famously to the Northern Kingdom of Israel. The Assyrians um, basically made them disappear from history, destroyed their capital, Jerusalem, took uh, m most of the people, or at least uh, all of the elites into exile. And that's where we get the 10 lost tribes. Famously also the Babylonian empire did the same thing to the Southern Kingdom of Judah in 587, 586 BCE, taking them into exile, destroying the city of Jerusalem and the temple in Jerusalem. Uh, and then Cyrus defeats Babylon in uh, about 539 uh, BCE and allows not only the Jews, but uh, all the other peoples who had been exiled by the Babylonians, uh, allows them to return home and even provides money to rebuild their temples. So Cyrus is known from uh, outside the Bible. We have a famous um, archaeological find called the Cyrus Cylinder. I, I mean, he's known outside of that too, but um, uh, the Cyrus Cylinder is this clay kind of cylinder that uh, was discovered, um, I believe in Babylon, if I'm remembering right, and allows uh, has Cyrus's decree allowing these peoples to go back to their homelands. In the Bible, Cyrus is mentioned... Uh, in a few different places, uh, Ezra, Isaiah, Daniel, and Second Chronicles, probably the two most significant places of those that he's mentioned are in Isaiah 45, where uh, God, uh, where Cyrus is spoken of as God's anointed, uh, even Messiah. You can, you, the the um, English word anointed translates the Hebrew word Mashiach, meaning anointed one. Mm -hmm. uh, and that God will use Cyrus to save God's people, not for Cyrus's sake, but because for the sake of God's people, uh, Judah. And then uh, the other significant place in Ezra chapter one, um, uh, Cyrus decrees that the Jews can return back to Jerusalem and rebuild their temple. And even, um, you know, uh, speaks of the, the, the Lord, the God of Israel as, uh, as the true God, right? So, uh, yeah, that's who Cyrus is. He's, he's the instrument, uh, biblically speaking, he's the instrument through whom God 
restores uh, the people of Judah uh, and brings them home from exile. So he is pretty well liked then. The biblical writers really like Cyrus for good reason. And that Cyrus cylinder, am I wrong that that's at the United Nations? As sort it, of a, a, an, like the first example of human rights or something like that? I, I nope. believe oh, that, that there's up. a copy, there's a copy maybe at the United Nations, but uh, he, that original Cyrus cylinder uh, is actually at the British Museum in London. Have you seen it? Oh, cool. You know what? I went to the British Museum recently, excited to see the Cyrus cylinder, and it was on loan to Yale University of all places. So, so you could have saved I, I, yourself a transatlantic trip. I could have. I could have just gone <laughs> to New Haven, Connecticut. But they had a wonderful facsimile of it. I mean, it, I wouldn't have known the difference if I hadn't seen the sign that said this is a facsimile. But yeah, pretty exciting, though. Yeah, that's really cool. Okay, cool. Thank you. Um, the second question is, what is the significance of the chords in Ezekiel 4, eight? All right, I so there were chords in Ezekiel four eight, so I'm excited to hear. In uh, Ezekiel four one through eight, um, is uh, Ezekiel is commanded to uh, get out his Lego set and build a model of <laughs> Jerusalem under siege, <laughs> and he's got to build the city and a ramp, and and uh, Ezekiel is is um, prophesying he. So Ezekiel was taken away in the first deportation in 597, uh, and then in 587, uh, the city was then, it rebelled against Babylon. Uh, so the, the, ba uh, the Babylonian emperor, um, Nebuchadnezzar, had subdued Jerusalem and taken away its elites, including the king, uh, to exile. Uh, so he takes his army, he walks all the way back to Babylon, and they rebel again. And um, in this, in that period, Ezekiel uh, from exile, he was a prophet called in exile. He he warned the people not to not to rebel. Uh, and then when they do rebel, he prophesies against the city, saying it's going to fall. And here, uh, it, uh, it, so uh, he he builds this model, and then he said he has to lay on his left side. God says three hundred and ninety days. And then on his right side, 40 days. And that is to symbolize the exile of the northern kingdom, which it's 390 days because he's counting the entire history of the northern kingdom as exile from the day of um, when this split came in 922 BC. Mm -hmm. uh, and then the, the southern kingdom, 40 days on his right side, to sig signal that the exile would last one generation. 40 was the uh, the number symbolizing one, uh, one generation. It doesn't necessarily mean exactly 40 years. Um, interestingly, the Septuagint didn't know how to do the math, and so they changed it to 150 years for the left side, uh, counting from the end of the Northern Kingdom, which is sort of interesting yeah. uh, that they didn't like the, the math uh, in the Hebrew and the chords. Then it says Ezekiel is tied down during this time so that he cannot move, uh, chained to his place. In other words, uh, signaling that there would be no. Uh, the the purpose of the chords is um, really symbolizing the uh, the irrevocable nature of this prophecy. So that's that's pretty dramatic. Did um. Did prophets often have to suffer physical things. pain <laughs> or do weird things as the prophets, my teacher Jim Roberts said, were unusual personalities. Isaiah <laughs> walked around naked, you know, for a few years to symbolize what would happen if they rebelled. Uh, you know, Jeremiah wore a, the yoke of an ox to signal if they rebelled, Babylon would put this yoke uh, of, of slavery around the people. Yeah, they did lots of weird things. I think Ezekiel is probably the weirdest of them. He's kind of psychedelic. I'm not sure. I mean, like 390 <laughs> yes. days lying on your side. Uh, yeah. I don't, I don't think that's, well, it's not I don't think that's your body. Possible, right? Like maybe you lie on you. Maybe that's for a portion of each day or something. But he he was called to do this. I think he just was trying to get out of work. <laughs> <That could be. laughs> no, right. yeah, Ezekiel... Ezekiel is the strangest of them all. And in mm -hmm. fact, there was a, 
uh, in Jewish tradition, uh, you're not supposed to read uh, Ezekiel until you're 30 years old. And as yeah, my friend sure. Rabbi Citron said, and in these days of inflation, 40. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that's cool. I yeah, like that. That's, true. that's, that's good. True. Yeah. All right. Well, that's really interesting. Cool. Okay. The next question is um, moving to the New Testament. Uh, it says in Luke 4, 14 through 30, and I think that's when Jesus stands up in the synagogue and, you know, says that he's been called to proclaim liberation to the captives and et cetera. Um, it says, did Jesus, and that he, and that this scripture was now fulfilled in him, Jesus was saying in the synagogue. So the question is, did Jesus read in the synagogue from the Septuagint in Greek or from a Hebrew? scroll well, that was an interesting question and i will amend the question before you answer it or from an aramaic scroll catherine mm. Mm. well i would say uh it's almost uh certain that jesus was reading from a hebrew scroll uh it, and just because uh, even today in the synagogue, you read uh, the Hebrew, right? You, mm -hmm. you, I mean, it's translated. You can you can read along in a translation, uh, but you read you read the Hebrew, uh, the original text of the of the Bible. There are certainly Aramaic translations, uh, and Aramaic, for those who don't know, was uh, a very a, a cousin of Hebrew, right? It's a Semitic language. Uh, and certainly the New Testament writers know of the Septuagint, the Greek translation of the Old Testament, but uh, I don't know, yeah, in in the synagogue, in a worship service, as it speaks of, that when it says Jesus took the scroll of the prophet Isaiah, I think it's pretty clear that, he, that it was the Hebrew scroll, a scroll written in Hebrew of the original language of Isaiah. Rolf, I think, would you agree with that or would you? I would that? agree with it. I, we know that Jesus spoke Aramaic because there's places where it quotes him as saying words in Aramaic, like mm. on the cross, mm -hmm. Eloi, Eloi, Lama Sabachthani. And um, we don't know if he spoke Greek or Latin. The language that people spoke in daily use in the Holy Land in the first century was Aramaic. And many of them would have also been able to speak Latin. Or Greek because of uh, the Hellenistic environment and and the presence of the Romans. But I agree, in the in the synagogue, it would have been um, it would have been uh, Hebrew. It is interesting that the Greek uses the word uh, the word that is translated scroll is actually biblion book. Oh, um, interesting. So it's it, the tra uh, the translation that translates it as scroll is actually um, sort of doing the Greek a favor and using scroll rather than translating what it actually says book. It's it's mm -hmm. making a, a historical assumption, I guess, huh? Yes. Yeah. It's, yeah, yeah. it's assuming the Hebrew. Yeah. yeah. Oh, sure. Yeah. 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 Right. Because books, books were uh, later inventions from scrolls. Yes. Yeah, scr scrolls started and then, yeah, then books. But oh, the, that's interesting. And even again, even today in the synagogue, you have sc actual scrolls, right? I mean, you have yes. books too, but the thing read in front of the congregation is a scroll, handwritten in Hebrew, hand copied, well, which well, is why there are still scribes today, right? Scribes have the task of very carefully uh, copying the the Hebrew onto a new scroll, and those scrolls are kept in uh, in in um, in an ark basically in a wooden box uh, and they're uh, yeah treated with the utmost respect you can imagine how hard how how precious they are how long it takes to you know handwrite for instance the scroll of the prophet Isaiah 66 chapters uh, and and to and to do it so carefully that you don't you know change scripture inadvertently so anyway uh yeah. I think cool. I think so. Hebrew from this, stuff. we can assume. I sometimes, sometimes I feel like I've heard that some people think Jesus was illiterate or something. So that from this, this refutes that, right? Well, it says he read from this yeah, <laughs> right. Isaiah. So I, I think that would pretty much refute that. But. Okay. <laughs> Good. <laughs> All right. 
Uh, our last question here is, why did Jesus's miracles happen on the Sabbath day? If, there, if, if the person is asking why did they only happen on the Sabbath day, I don't think that's accurate. That yeah. uh, doesn't say he, it doesn't say that he only did miracles on the Sabbath day. If they're asking why did Jesus choose to um, violate the Sabbath law uh, and heal or um, do other miracles like cast out demons on the Sabbath, uh, yeah. Jesus answers that uh, himself saying is that um, – the Sabbath was made for human, humankind mm -hmm. uh, for our benefit. It was not made to bind us. In other words, we weren't made to obey. The purpose of us, our lives, is not to obey the Sabbath law, but rather the Sabbath law is to serve human well uh, flourishing, let's say. And that would include, therefore, uh, doing acts of mercy on the Sabbath, which is also allowed in most forms of Judaism. Yeah. 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 I, when I, yeah. Um, in, in Mark chapter two, it's not, uh, it's not a miracle he's doing in this particular place, but he's allowing his disciples to pluck heads of grain and eat them on the Sabbath. And the, you know, strictly speaking, you're not supposed to harvest grain on the Sabbath. And so the Pharisees uh, call them out on this. And he says, as, as you just said, Rolf, the Sabbath was made for humankind and not humankind for the Sabbath. So that's not to say that Jesus abolishes the Sabbath law, but to s he fulfills the spirit of the Sabbath law, one might say. Uh, you know, that, that as you said, Rolf, the Sabbath is made for human flourishing. And I, whenever, I, whenever I teach one of these controversy stories, I I think about uh, one of the scrolls of the Dead Sea Scrolls that, um, in which that particular Jewish sect, the people uh, who lived at Qumran by the Dead Sea, were even stricter than the Pharisees and the Sadducees. And uh, uh, I'm forgetting which uh, scroll it is. I think it's the uh, Order of the Community. The Community Rule says something like, "If if a if a animal falls into a pit on the Sabbath, you can't lift it out." If a human being falls in a pit on the Sabbath, you can lift him out, but only if you happen to be carrying rope with you, or can't don't have to go too far to get rope to uh, to get that person out. So, so one but, must always carry rope on one's person on the Sabbath day, just in case. Apparently, in case wow. your neighbor falls into a pit. So, yeah. So the, um, there's differing interpretations of the Sabbath law, but um, Jesus says the Sabbath is made for human flourishing. So, of course, healing uh, would be something to do uh, on the Sabbath. Well, thank you both so much. Um, this has been awesome. Uh, and thank you to our listeners who submitted uh, such interesting questions. Uh, and you can get more content like this on uh, enterthebible.org, where we have blog posts, resources, commentaries, uh, outlines and deep dives into every book of the Bible. Uh, and videos, all, all kinds of stuff over there. Uh, and of course, if you have enjoyed uh, watching this podcast on YouTube or listening to it on your favorite podcast app, please uh, rate, review, like, subscribe, do all the things. Uh, and most importantly, uh, share the podcast with a friend. Until next time. <laughs>